Hi, and welcome to Clear Studies. I am your host, Bishop A. Reginald Littman. Be sure to subscribe so that you won't miss new episodes. I am delighted to welcome you here. Stay tuned. I'll be right back after this. Join my e-class. I'd love to send you a free PDF handout of today's lesson, along with wonderful discussion questions to help you dive deeper in your study. Send an email right now to clearstudies at gmail.com. Again, that's clearstudies at gmail.com. Don't forget to subscribe, leave a comment, and hit that bell notification so you'll be notified every time new content is loaded. We look forward to sharing with you every single week. Well, welcome back to part one of this exciting series on the life of Joseph. In this session, we're going to be looking at the maze of Joseph's boyhood. The maze of Joseph's boyhood. Letter A, the problem areas of his childhood. We're going to talk about the problem areas of his childhood. Now, Joseph's upbringing was not an easy one by far. In fact, his early years were like a minefield. It is amazing that anybody could survive the pain, the turmoil, and all of the things that he went through, yet maintain their sanity, their godliness, their integrity, and even their emotions. Let's take just a moment just to look at some of the events that marked young Joseph's life. Now, we've already talked about the problems in the home. One man with children by four different women, all living under the same roof. That, my friends, is a recipe for trouble any day. Add to this the fact that Jacob obviously loved Rachel more than the other women, and you have trouble enough to go around. And you'll find that in Genesis chapter 30. At a young age, Joseph and his family make a hasty departure from his grandfather Laban's house. They flee away under the cover of darkness, and that's in Genesis 31, 17 through 21. The reason is because Jacob had cleaned out his father-in-law's house through deception. Well, when you really look at this story, you'll discover something interesting. That not only had Jacob been a trickster, but now the wife that he married, whom he was tricked into marrying, is also a trickster. Imagine that you're Joseph, and your grandfather is chasing the family. He overtakes the family, and he has harsh words with your father. Laban accuses Jacob of stealing his household gods. This was a really big thing in their time. And Jacob denies this, but it turns out that Rachel had actually taken them. She lies to her father to cover up her own theft. Isn't that amazing how this runs in circles in this family? And yet this is Joseph's upbringing. Well, Jacob and Laban make a covenant to stay away from one another. In fact, Laban departs and Joseph will never see his grandfather again. This has to be a very painful and emotional moment for him. How often have you ever heard a pastor or preacher at the end of a service close the service by saying, everyone elevate your right hand and repeat after me. May the Lord watch between me and thee while we're absent one from another. Well, those words, my friends, are recorded in Genesis chapter 31, verse 49. But that passage is not a prayer of blessing for dismissal. It is actually a threat of violence. Because what happened in that passage is that these two, this father and son, were making a pact and asking God to keep a distance between them. Otherwise, there would have been bloodshed and mayhem. Imagine that as you're traveling, word comes from your father's brother Esau that he is sending a group of men out to confront the family. Man, Jacob is afraid of Esau because of the way he had treated him some 20 years earlier. And so he divides his flocks into three parts to be used as a bribe to try to soften the heart of Esau. And that's Genesis 32 verse 1 through 23. Joseph's older sister Dinah is raped by Shechem. Two of his brothers, Simeon and Levi, trick the men of the city and eventually kill all the men in the city in Genesis, Genesis 34, verse 1 through 31. Deborah, Rebekah's nurse, dies in Genesis 35 and 8. And Jacob does nothing to make any of these things right. He has the power to do so, but he does not take the initiative to actually try to fix and resolve the family issues that are going on in his house. 
Rachel, Joseph's mother, dies while giving birth to his little brother, Benjamin, in Genesis 35, verse 16 through 20. Reuben, the oldest brother, commits incest with his father's concubine, Bilhah, in Genesis 35, verse 21 and 22. And Jacob knows about it, but does nothing about it. Joseph's other grandfather, who was Isaac, dies and he is buried in Genesis 35, verse 27 through 29. So as you can see in Genesis 35, so much happens back to back, thing after thing, crisis after crisis that shapes Joseph's life. And yet Jacob does nothing about it. Joseph's older brothers were all wicked and self-centered men, and yet Jacob remained a passive father who allowed his children to do whatever they wanted to do without any correction or punishment. Jacob was also guilty of favoritism, just like his mother was, because he loved Joseph more than the rest of his sons in Genesis 37 verse 3 we see that. Joseph lost his beloved mother at a young age. Joseph is swiftly and abruptly uprooted and moved at a young age. And Joseph is surrounded by the worst environment. I mean, rape, murder, incest, treachery, jealousy, idolatry, intrigue, death, and hatred are all of the fabrics that are woven together that shape the surroundings of young Joseph. This was a very negative and hostile environment for any child to be raised in. And perhaps even as you're listening to me, you might look back at your own life and say, you know what, my upbringing had so many problems in it, and there's so many facets of my own upbringing that I regret. And we can all look at our past and see some areas that we wish we had not experienced or been exposed to, or even if it was not in our household, if it was in our family in another city, just to hear about violence in homes or to hear about alcoholism or drug addiction or just living that was not the epitome of what is pure and proper for a child to be brought up in. Maybe you or someone you know in your family was abused physically mentally or even sexually. And hearing what Joseph faced may have even brought up some bad memories of your own past. But let me encourage you today. Place your past in the hands of the Sovereign Lord. Trust Him for the grace to live with the memories. Live in spite of the memories. Live beyond the memories. And God will give you strength to even avoid seeing in future generations the things that may have happened in your own past. Now where did all this dysfunction come from? This dysfunction actually stems back to their great-great-grandparents, Abram and Sariah. Back in Genesis chapter 12, verse 10 through 20, Abram causes Sariah to lie. And they were actually half brother and sister, but he wanted her to deny that she was his wife also because his life was on the line. And yet this lie from Genesis chapter 12 was the foundation from the lies that we see succinctly happen all the way through Genesis chapter number 37. In Genesis chapter 16, verse 1 through 16, there was a problem in the family that was also passed down when Sarai, Sarah could not conceive and she gives Hagar, her concubine, to Abraham to create a child trying to help the Lord out. And it caused all kind of havoc in the family. And looking at the problems that existed in this home, we should have a desire to avoid these kinds of mistakes. Just for the record, here's how to build a dysfunctional home. If you want to build a dysfunctional home, be less than truthful with one another. Be jealous of other family members. Demonstrate favoritism to one child over another child. If you want to live in a dysfunctional family and create a dysfunctional environment, try to help God out in accomplishing his will, but doing it your way. If you want to be dysfunctional and live a dysfunctional life and create a dysfunctional environment for your children, practice deception so you can get your way, manipulation and control so you can get things to happen your way, your time, on your dime. 
and then operate outside of the will of God. Those are all recipes for dysfunction in your family, dysfunction in your life. If you live a life of anger, manipulation, and control, congratulations, you will have successfully created a dysfunctional family. You see, sin is always the root cause of all dysfunction. I don't care what it is or where it is in any home. But let's look secondly at the positive areas of, ch of Joseph's childhood. Let it be the positive areas of Joseph's childhood. Not everything was negative in Joseph's background. There were a few positive moments along the way. And let me just share a few with you that you may see God's hand is shaping the life of this very special young man by the name of Joseph. Now one night, Jacob sent his family ahead and he stayed behind to pray about his upcoming meeting with Esau. You would think that was a little cowardly for him to send his family ahead, but he was trying to soften the blow with Esau and trying to come to some type of agreement and arrangement by showing kindness, by sending his family and him not coming. But in his staying back, thinking about this encounter with Esau, he has an encounter with the eternal. But Jacob wrestled with an angel all night long, according to Genesis 32. And when he catches back up with his family, he's a changed man. He is limping on his leg, and therefore he has a new way of walking. The angel also changes his name and told him you will no longer be called Jacob, which means trickster, deceiver, or heel grabber. But his new name would be Israel, which means prince with God. Jacob has a new name, a new walk, and a new life. And he would never live like a trickster again. Surely the change in his father was something that Joseph never forgot. And as you think about that change that Joseph witnesses in his father, how would it impact the life of your children? or grandchildren, or godchildren, or stepchildren, if they saw a tremendous change in you. Well, God calls Jacob to come back to Bethel, which means the house of God. And Jacob demands that they do away with all their false gods. Wow! He calls his family together to worship God and God alone. And while they're there, Jacob builds an altar, worships the Lord, and gives the testimony of how he first met the Lord. That's all in Genesis 35. Surely, young Joseph never forgot the lessons he learned and the testimonies he heard at Bethel. In Genesis 35, verse 5, it tells us that his, this family journeyed. As they continued to journey, they enjoyed divine protection. They were surrounded by warlike tribes of angels, but they were never attacked. This must have made a really serious impression on Joseph. To know the change and to see the change and to mark the change in your father and to see God turn it around, forgive him, surround you with a host of angels. I'm sure that was something that shaped Joseph's faith in God and Joseph's belief in the power of God. As I said earlier, most of us can find flaws in our family and our upbringing. I certainly can. Yet most of us can also look back and see times when God revealed his hand in our lives. Even at a young age, I remember prayers. I remember church services. I remember some of the faces and names and even the wardrobe of the godly people that were in my life. They left an indelible imprint on me spiritually. And I thank God for those times when the Lord moved even in darkness, even in times of sin, even in times of trouble, and how God providentially protected our family with his hand. Listen, you can never underestimate the importance of positive influences on a child's life. Hey, be sure to go to clearstudies at gmail.com. I want you to join my e-class. You'll get a transcript of this teaching along with some very, very impactful questions to help you to apply this lesson to your own life, to think deeper than I have time to deliver in these 15 minutes. I love you so much. Thank you for joining me. Be sure to subscribe to the channel. I'll see you in the next episode.